And here we are with the Hardwick boys. How are we doing? How's life post Milan, post, you know, life in the fight world? How's life back in the Middlesbrough front? Uh, well, well, Milan, we were stuck in a room for five days, not really leaving. And now we're back stuck, not really allowed <laughs> to leave. Uh, so, yeah, not much has changed, really. I moved the buffet. Oh, the buffet was good. That's the point, though. Like, cutting weight, like, locally, you can sort of, you know, crack on with the meal prep and stuff. What's, like, cutting weight like out there? Because obviously you've got, you know, all the part, you got all the, um, everything you want, all the carbs, everything. Oh, that was, it was actually really easy, that one. It was probably easier as well because you didn't have to, like, go about and get tempted by everything. But, uh, like, the buffet there just had its own area for Bellator people. Yeah, you might have, like, Bellator paid for, like, everyone's food the whole time you were there. So it would be, when we got back, I was actually missing getting emails every morning, lunchtime, and, and tea. That, oh, buffet is open from this time to this time. Uh, there was a few little instances though where they didn't really have anything appropriate on the buffet because, I, <laughs> you know, you're a you're a hotel kitchen. What the hell? How, how do you know what weight cutting is? There was, I think it was Gavin Hughes was trying to ask for some chicken with no seasoning on it. And the Italian guy was just baffled by the idea of not having seasoning. <laughs> Absolutely. Kind of, yeah. Like, he was just, oh, can I have no salt on it? And he was like, uh, no salt? Oregano? <laughs> like, a question. <laughs> like an insult. It's a sacrilegious action. He was action. confused. He, he looked worried for the guy. He was like... <laughs> they probably saw his name and gave him probably like Big Max, this sort of thing, Big Tasties, this, that, and the other. <laughs> He's one of them ones, like... And that is a point, because... <laughs> at least to be fair these like champagne problems you wouldn't get this on the local show so can I know like in you know shock and aura or whatever battle arena haven't given me my nice canapes it's not quite the same level of hors d'oeuvres on demand <laughs> yeah the hotel was quite fancy as well like it was the Sheraton right near the San Siro in Milan um, but I don't know if it's because like where we were the views from our our rooms was just some like park and a block of flats we just thought oh Milan must be shite <laughs> no, <laughs> and then it was only the last the last day we looked out the window of the gym and we're like there it is like there was the Alps and the fucking stadium and the city and everything <laughs> it's just flats it's like an industrial estate that's what Milan is it's just like slough but yeah so like obviously back on the home front everything else is all been a bit of rope regards to getting your training in so preparation for that then obviously you guys knew a lot a lot long, a early before the actual announcement so what was your training like prior to that then were you doing a lot of like stuff together was it just independent cardio stuff were you doing a lot of rogue training no one needs to know but what was going on probably with other people who compete so in a way it was kind of easier because there was no helping to run classes in the gym or folks are doing one-to-ones with it in PT sessions. It was just all isolated under the training for a fight. So regards of that then to how your camps will be post lockdown and back to normal quote unquote, have you noticed much of a difference in that? Do you feel you'd want to, I don't know, when you have a camp isolate that time away, stop coaching, stop doing everything else just for your camp itself or would you like the balance still? I don't. I don't mind coaching sessions. You know. uh, it's just you gotta you gotta knock a lot of it on the head, I guess. I mean, I've, I'm trying to really cut down on the the amount of sort of extra coaching I do anyway. Like, I'm trying not to do too many one to ones, just because before my shoulders were knacking. Like, I was training for fighting full time and then to holding pads, however many hours. It's like my shoulders don't feel good. Like, really, like Jamie Bates, the um, glory kickboxer he's had a bad shoulder injury recently and I'm like yeah well he, he trains twice a day and hold, holds pads for his job I'm like yeah I've got to avoid that yeah no time for that sort of noise and it's one of those things you wouldn't even think unless you've been doing it that's actually a thing you think okay just holding a pad it can't hurt that much but not all the sort of shock in your shoulder or your rotator cuff it takes a fucking pound the hard punches a lot of the time it's the people who maybe don't even punch that hard they're just kind of punch mongy they're, they're not really aiming for the pad. They're aiming for the area where the pad is. And sometimes they get lucky, but a lot of the times they just twist your shoulder off this. But... <laughs> yeah, I think that's a technical term as well. I think that's what um, what's the Freddie Roach calls it. <laughs> I'm not too sure. <laughs> yeah, it's one of them ones. That used to be an offensive term, but I think MMA and Jiu-Jitsu people have just hijacked it for, for their own. 
<laughs> the gringo sort of, you know, linguistics. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just like, okay. You've been hijacked now. It's, it's perfectly fine to say, I think. Yeah, so when I could I say, I think you've got a sign off now from you, from Harry Harwick official, a little P- LPC. Yeah, no, no, that's... <laughs> the... I'm not used to saying it, I didn't even realise. It's <laughs> <laughs> in the sort of combat sports community. It's... Well, I've had, uh, you know, when I was doing sports science at Teesside Uni, and uh, there was people with master's degrees, even some people with doctorates who ran strength and conditioning programmes. He actually used the term, oh, sometimes you just get movement monks. And these are like... <laughs> I think, is, that I like, like... is that some sort of like acronym? Does it stand for something? No, they're just a bit... <laughs> <laughs> it's just, uh, just when they're struggling to teach people uh, certain movements. They're just like, oh, he, he's just calling them movement monks. Oh. Well, martial arts awesome. games are a fucking like, magnet for movement monks. You, you'll know as well, those people that just never, ever ever learn hey right. so the best thing we pick up with these i'm gonna you guys can say it by all means but i, I, I need to be careful with these i'm the host of some of me <laughs> but, but warm-ups warm-ups is the best one because everyone's a bit quiet they don't really know you know they haven't introduced themselves properly they're trying to get their feet and okay cool cartwheel stuff like that if they haven't done it before it's one thing but shrimps like what the fuck did you just call me <laughs> it's like <laughs> <laughs> It's a bit of a rogue one at that point. Like, what do you find it normally? Is it sort of once you find people sort of okay, you're going to be hard work? Is it sparring? What stage do you normally clock them when they're a bit, you know, hard work? There's, there's one movement, and I think both of us are going to say it now. It's the if you make someone do a Granby roll, I, I, I don't really have room to demonstrate it, but instead of rolling over their shoulders, they roll over their knees and their forehead. Like, if you know <laughs> what? How are you doing that? They like, probably room with them. <laughs> George is going to try and demonstrate. So here we have. Move your water. So there's that proper Grundy roll where it's like going over the shoulder. Yes, yeah, so the sort of like inversion rolls you do, sort of like over the shoulder line to try and keep your feet, feet well, on the floor as well. You see it so many times where like newer people, they'll just go right under their face. <laughs> 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 that's going to, the audio of that's going to be mint <laughs> so everyone listening so we had George just going aside basically the gist of it is you're sat up right and then you try and roll along your shoulder like a teddy bear roll like back at school kind of thing try and keep your feet on the floor so you can basically keep in the same lines so your feet don't leave the floor and you roll but what George did essentially instead of going on your shoulder you just flop on your side and because you're just dead weight the only place for movement you've got is your forehead to push off <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the thing is, that's it. like tr- t- next time you take a warm up in your, you know, whenever you're allowed to do classes without telling people about them, or while telling people, about them. but next time you do a warm up, make people do Granby rolls, and you'll notice it's all the difficult people do that exact movement. I'm not saying it's like a bad thing. People work through it. It's not. Yeah. But it's, there's, there's it's more like anything. Though. If you didn't know anything, like you know, first time doing something is going to be a bit hard work. But you know, it's the volume of people you see. It's not like you know, oh, everyone's shit because they can't do everything we can do. But you know, it's I said like yeah. I can do it well. I'm one of those. But you know, I'm just laughing because it's funny to join in. But, <laughs> but um, you know, you've got to give more credit when they're trying. It's not picked up straight away. Yeah, like like those kind of people who sort of they start off as movement mongs, but unmong themselves. If you know what I mean. The unmonging. I think they, unmong, they unmong through their own effort, which is a very admirable process. <laughs> I still, I'm still not sure if this is an offensive term. I think they, it they, is. <laughs> there's no they're, uncertainty. They're, <laughs> it's just going to get flagged. They, they, apo- they apologised recently on Strictly for Anton Dubeck using the word limp. I'm like, not that I watch Strictly, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's... It's getting difficult. Right. Not that I want to. Sometimes after tea, I, you know, it's, it's, it's sad. I still live at home. So mum, mum watches Strictly. Oh, does and she? he'll sometimes just be like, oh, oh I'm too full. I'm just going to sit here and watch. He comes out. <laughs> <laughs> what was it the other, the other week? It was like Bill Bailey got like a, a 10 or something. Well, it's the first time we got an 8 off Craig. And that was a bit. And then George, involunt- like mum told me, it was George involuntarily went, Whoa! <laughs> it's just this season, all right. Yeah, this season's a good lineup. It's this essential strictly that we. 
I'm sorry, I can't. <laughs> that caught me that, that genuine, sincere, like, happy for him. It was that. It was when you see a mate win like a fight or a competitive jiu jitsu match, or whatever, you're like, yes, you proper liked, came from the heart. That's what that was. You're like, fucking go on. <laughs> I tell you what, in um the states, what you get a lot of is um some of the more I don't know, well respected like let's say respected the more famous fighters going like Dance with the Stars from the current like Cage Warriors, Bellator roster. Who would you want to see on Strictly? Who would you reckon would be funny? Cage mm, oh, Warriors and Bellator, Cage Warriors. Like, so who, who do you think would be funny? Not who do you think would be good? Well, obviously funny. Who cares if they're right. good? <laughs> Everyone's a fun. Uh. Oh, this is this Arnold will be. <laughs> <Roy Nelson. laughs> I'm keeping it more UK because obviously that's like oh, yeah. Americans in the UFC, the English cage warriors, strictly. You know what would work? You get Terry Brazier and the professional dancer that's his partner is that fucking weird guy on that Channel Four thing that oh, choreographed yeah. his dance routine for him. <laughs> what? <laughs> That, the, that was painful. That was, did you watch that? What's this going on? What, what on earth is this? So, basically, when... Uh, I've the name of the event. It was the one where Harry had his Bellator debut. Uh, Terry Brazier fought Soren back. Oh, yeah. And for his entrance, he had a load of... It was like dance students in black... Like, you know, like contemporary dance, like black vests and black yeah. jockey bots and all that. Kind of do this weird looking routine and then like the dancers get on the hands and knees and like link arms and sort of try and form together to make some dog human centipede hybrid <laughs> and everyone just thought it looked a bit bondagey and i think you've taken a bit of stick for it but, but the, the there's um the choreographer who made that dance routine is apparently a big deal i don't i don't know but Recently, I think it was only a few weeks ago, it aired, there was like a Channel 4 program where this choreographer who was just camp as fuck was like trying to understand violence by hanging about with some MMA fighters. So I think he was hanging about with Brazier, Shit, Mike Shipman and MVP. And he was sort of like asking them all kinds of things. <laughs> like he was watching MVP do quite a light spa by London Shoe Fight standards from what I've heard. And he was like just watching this part, going, oh, the, the violence, I, I don't like it, I can't handle it. <laughs> but then he said, he said to Terry Brazier, oh, I'll choreograph a, a dance routine entrance for you. And Terry Brazier kind of reluctantly, I think, so went, okay. And you can see there's a shot of like Brazier watching them rehearse it. So it's the first time he's seen it. And have you seen that meme where it's like the black and white Vietnam picture with someone staring? Okay. <laughs> someone, that's, the expression, that's the expression on Terry Brazier's face when he sees it for the first time. Oh, I think that's painful because I remember his fight with um, Alex Lahore. I think it was that one or then it was Reese McKee before he went to Bellator. Because again, he was very much like, you know, cool, composed guys out. And then that transition to like, okay, what have I signed up for? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, like, you know, he's... he's Fucking manly as fuck, isn't he? He's well, this is it. So, that's what I mean. It's so like polar opposite. <laughs> yeah, for, and he he'd probably be the worst dancer at all. He's he's, he's got like, you know, he, he's a very stiff, hard nosed fighter. Like when when he wins fights, it's because he fights hard as fuck. It's mm. not because he's like you know like MVP where just everything's just like graceful. Just what what? Frazier's just this gritty, hard nosed mm. cunt who. <laughs> Somehow, through pure just misfortune, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's such an awkward situation when you get dance routines forced upon you. When you. It's like when you get like an ugly jumper for Christmas that's the wrong size, but you have to kind of wear it a few times at least. Oh, I can't. It's one of them ones as well, because obviously better to the like more, more production, like the walkouts, the music, everything else. So you think, okay, I've got. I guess I've got to do this as well. It's like if some random on the internet makes you like a promo video, like a montage. I guess I've got to repost it, otherwise it's a bit rude. But yeah, yeah but this guy was like making a documentary for Channel Four, so Bellator would have probably been like, "You have to do that." Like, oh, he's he's he, with Channel Four. You've got to do it now. Mm. Yeah. Oh, I hate that song. Who, who are Terry? The thing is, Soren Back, who we fought that night, just had he he wore like a Viking thing and some mm. some fake axe, and his entrance music was just. Like continuously for about the three or four minutes it took him to walk like down that one. this short run. 
Yeah, he just walked out of the car back. earlier at Bangs. Look, <laughs> looking calm as fuck. Just, oh. And it was a fucking mint entrance, and then the fight was shite. Yeah. The thing is, so I'm back here, that's the whole like, Viking stick and like, the whole cage war as well. Did you see his fight against Paddy Pimlet? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's all right. <laughs> he's, he's good. It's just, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. That's the... he's, he's one of those fighters that they're, they're somehow a professional fighter, but they're not violent at all, if you get me. There's, like, there's a few of them. You know, like in the sense, and they don't try and like strike. They're trying to grapple, or is in like they just don't. Well, it's not. It's not even like the, the grappling. Like you can, you can be a predominantly grappling based fighter and be a violent bastard. Like mm. Shinya Aoki is a violent bastard, and all he does is grapple. He can't strike for shit. He couldn't hurt someone if he'd like punch. You know. Yeah. He, he fought a forty year old Sakuraba and had to punch him a hundred times before the ref thought, "Oh, I've got to stop this." He's an, <laughs> Actually, but you, you know, he's a violent bastard. <laughs> Uh, he just Sorin back just doesn't seem like he's he's violent. I don't know. Firing all the shots in this, we've, we've covered a lot of ground. So we covered the disabled, we've covered the beginners, we've covered Terry Frazier and Sorin back in general dance routine. I mean, it's, it's like, yeah, we've covered strictly as well. Oh, obviously, that's we'll get back around to that. But regards the rest of the cage was roster, I'm curious who else would be quite good on that. I mean, uh, street, I, I mean. George would be good on Strictly, not because he's skillful, but because he's just it so much. <laughs> mega <laughs> confident. Like he's just insanely confident. Like the even the worst dance moves kind of work when George does them. I don't it's know. I think. <laughs> he's got. He's come back a little. This is, yeah. it. this is just general laziness, to be honest. I mean, with um, like I think it was after your last fight, George. Even if you were saying you had um, like Jacko on in the changing room, and that you're having a bit of a boogie, is that a bit of a thing for you anyway? You always are uh, having a dance in that. That was a new thing I did in this one because sometimes you have fights where you're in the changing room and then you just get into your warmth and you start shadow boxing and the stiffness is still there, and you kind of carry that through the pads and the grappling drills and the stuff you'll do to warm up. Whereas that one, I thought, you know what, I'll have a, just a dance. You know, it's. It gets the mobility <laughs> going and all that. And it, and it gets the stiffness gone before you start shadow boxing. So you're not carrying that through the warm up into the fight. That really and, uh, it was quite a funny situation because mine and uh, Nicolo Soli's changing rooms were like next door to each other. And he had his door shut. And but he was like smashing pads for like an hour before it going, let's go, bang, let's go, bang, let's go. And I was just kind of sat there napping. And then it got about half an hour before. I thought, oh, I'm, I'm going to have a little dance now. So whilst he's going, like, let's go, Bang, let's go. I'm just kind of, oh, <laughs> So not a bit of you, Harry, even before Richie. My warm-up room, there was other people warming up. So I don't know if, if I could have done a Michael Jackson. <laughs> if, <laughs> you it, make room. if it was crashed with other people. You can't handle dancing on Michael Jackson anyway. There's you no just, kids about us, though. Rick Astley and Rick Astley alone. <laughs> yeah, to be fair, I can dance to Rick Astley. That, that's it. That's my dance repertoire right there. I can do I can do the double dutch better than anyone. Get channel four on the phone, Bella Tour, next walkout. <laughs> <laughs> that's that sorted. <laughs> Fuck it. Give Jude a call, we'll get get it booked. It's, it's one of them. If I get to if I get to meet meet Rick Astley, sound. <laughs> I mean, how long is that conversation? Five, maybe ten minutes? Oh, I love your song. Oh, cheers, mate. So, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> then what? And what are his other songs? Exactly. Uh, who cares? Like, have you seen him? Um, because he's really good friends with Dave Grohl. Sometimes Foo Fighters will just go, and it's Rick Astley, and he'll just come on stage, and, st- and it'll be a Foo Fighters version of Never Gonna Give You Up with Rick Astley doing the vocals. Because like, he's dreadful. just... The, the, they're just good mates, so he's just like, oh, Rick Astley's in town. Let's get him to do a song. And everyone just goes apeshit for it because it's like, well, I didn't expect this. I've got more than I've paid for you. It's the equivalent of Mr. Brightside in a nightclub. It's one of those, just throw it in because it's a safe bet. <laughs> it's just fucking yeah. whack on. <laughs> now, that's the thing as well. We came to like, your last fights as well. With um, you and Richie, um, Harry, like you were saying in the interviews as well, you were, you saw him quite a lot in the build-up to it. Obviously, like, you're walking around like, in the same plane, like a seat between each other. You were... The hotel pretty much closed, which I've even before the fight itself. What was that like? Because obviously, there's no animosity as such, but it's a bit of a you kind of know you've both been trying to kill each other for the last like eight, 12 weeks, whatever it is. Uh, with Small, it was all right. Like, he was just, he's just some sound bloke. So it's just there. 
I have no problem punching a person who I think sound like it's it really. I've had enough fights now where like seeing the opponent's not not a big deal. It's not like when you first start fighting, and then you get to the venue and you see them like you could just see them there, and your heart starts racing and that because mm. you because you don't really know what to expect, and your brain goes and like f starts firing. It's all right with Smullen. We, he's had many fights. I've had many fights. It's just it's just all right. It was nowhere near as funny as the Rose one. Like me and Nathan Rose, it was just like every time we saw each other, it was just like staring, <laughs> staring each other out. It must have been so exhausting, surely. Go on. Oh, yeah. Did, did we cover the lift story with Nathan Rose about no, after the Nathan Rose fight? I can't remember. Let's go again. Let's go on. Uh, you, uh, who shall have this one? Oh, I'll, I'll have it. Oh, you yeah. It, it's my story. It was my fight. Fuck yeah. you. <laughs> We're having to like develop interview etiquette because like we're trying to not to talk over each other but also let each other talk in it because we get interviewed together a lot. It's quite it's difficult. A, it's anyway, a conversation, not, a pod, not an interview. Anyway, carry on. It's not a, pod, not an interview. It's a conversation. Good point, good point. The list, sorry. So it was after the Rose fight. We'd sort of, we'd headed back to the hotel, which was only across the street. Um, we get in this lift and there's just fuckloads of drunk people already in the lift. And they're, they're talking, you know, just to be merry. Yeah. And then Cause we're, we're heading up to the it's like the sky bar they call it like the bar on the top floor slash club thing just to see what it's like um but yeah we're just in the lift and then rose comes in the lift by himself and then it's like it immediately becomes tense like they the other people who don't know what's going on stop talking like it's just immediately really tense but then the lift kind of gets jammed with the doors still open and it's like we were, we were stood awkwardly for about 30, like 20, 30 seconds. And then I sort of go, oh, you've got to press this button. And I'm like leaning over Rose with like my head near his dick. <laughs> like right. trying, to, trying to press this button so the lift doors would shut. Yeah. It, it goes up. Rose gets out before us. Then the lift closes. And then George just goes, well, that was awkward. And the, these drunk people, oh, what was that awkward? What was it there? And I was like, oh, I've, I've just fought him in that arena. <laughs> and they were like, what are you fought him? And like, yeah, yeah, I've, I've just beat him. Like, you won with that on your head. What the fuck? Hey! And then they just started like dancing around doing all this stuff. And then they got out the lift and were like, that was fucking weird. And then the sky bar was <laughs> so shit. Weird. So as, as we head back down, John Kavanagh comes in the lift, looks at the big gash on my head and goes, did you cut yourself shaving? <laughs> That's incredible, I love that. But again, that sort of thing, it's like, yeah, you, you both know what sort of happened as well. It's so weird that everyone else in the lift could sort of feel that kind of like, <laughs> it's like intention. Yeah, that, that is odd. I don't know if it's like humans have got a sense for like the atmosphere of a situation. Uh, I don't know, but it was, it was weird. Like everyone shut up. It was fucking bizarre. That's the thing of drunk as well. People aren't known for being considerate, so to speak. You know, self-aware. Yeah, but... Like, honestly, it was so fucking weird. And then just the fact that I had to lean over him again, the fucking <laughs> like right in his. Oh yeah, I was proper in his crotch space. You had to give him a kiss as well, you know, just be polite. You don't want to like, you know, <laughs> leave a sour note. I dominate you in the cage. <laughs> I dominate you in the lift. <laughs> That's it, round two, boys. Ding ding. Oh <laughs> yeah, you, George. What are you like with um your opponents? Is it personal at all? Is it just business? Do you like you try and not mean mug as such, but you know, stare him um, at that kind of stuff. I don't know, because it's normally like, it's normally not an aggressive situation. It's just an awkward situation. It's too busy dancing. Um, and that's like a very comfortable situation for me. <laughs> it's like, it's throughout the years of whittling down my awkwardness, it just, everyone else is in an awkward situation, but that just feels like a regular situation. So it's like, it doesn't uh, factor in. Just, I keep it more an awkward situation than an aggressive situation. Oh, the situation's quite comfortable. It's like a face-off. Like you're trying to meet mug each other, but it's just really uncomfortable. You just can't quite get your pose right. You can't settle. You're both just trying to make eye contact, but keep turning away. It's proper cringe. Oh, my God, I can't. This is incredible. My favourite one of any of like your opponents or anything pre-fight, though, was um, Robin Ruse's coach. Oh, yeah, that was a good one. Uh, uh, Swedish guy last year called Robin Ruse of fighting. Uh, but a few hours before the fight, I'm just walking around and I see his coach. He's like very like short, squat, wide man, just very muscular. And he just looks at me and goes, "George, Sweden." I'm like, uh, "Okay." 
It will be a great fight. <laughs> Do you not say Middlesbrough? <laughs> Whatever his name is. <laughs> Middlesbrough. <laughs> 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 a lot slower, a lot less enthusiastic. <laughs> no, the thing is, Middlesbrough shit, but we love Middlesbrough. Like it's it's the weird thing. Like someone summed it up on a on a radio thing that I seen before. It was like how everyone who's from Middlesbrough feels about Middlesbrough. It's like I hate it and it's shit, but I fucking love Middlesbrough. I really love it, even though it's shit and I hate it, but I love it and it's so good. <laughs> like. Everyone's got this weird sort of thoughts with Middlesbrough. I don't know what it is. It's the Palmo is a thing, isn't it? Palmo. That's what it's got to be. Oh, that's the Palmo. No. Yeah, yeah. Our, um, a few places doing. A few places doing, but it was our friend um, Sophie Robinson, Paul Robinson, their place, Park End Pizzeria. They did the OG festive Palmo. Like, so you know what? <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, uh, but do you know what Palmo is? It's it's Breaded and deep fried, either chicken or pork, you know, something like pork mainly, mainly chicken. Mainly chicken. Most people have chicken palm oils because most places do shake pork palm oils. Legitimately, the only two places that do decent pork palm oils that I've tried are Park and Pizzeria in, um, whatchamacallit, Central Park is a decent one. There's probably some. There's probably some others. But anyway, so you've got your, your breaded chicken or pork, your bechamel sauce, your cheese, but then the festive palm oil, it's pigs in blankets cut up on top of it and look. And little balls of stuffing. It's just, oh, 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 we need. This oh, is, it's so good. They do it every year. It's like we haven't had the first our first ones this year. We need we need to get that sorted. I mean, I need to come up for that. I think the next podcast we do has got to be in person with Palmos. That's a lot of peas. Yeah, uh, I'm down for that. <laughs> in person Palmos podcast with P- the pizzeria. Yeah. That's perfect. <laughs> Too many peas. That's in a lot person peas Palmo in- pizzeria park end podcast. I don't know where to follow from that, but we'll move on swiftly. Tell you what, I'll give a shout out to the podcast sponsors. We've got sponsors, The English Hypnotist, Rico Clothing, and The People's IT. Be sure to check them out. Links will be in the description for all their services. Any sponsors you guys want to shout out whilst we have a little shout out to sponsors and stuff? Uh, Red Gear, uh, J-Max Scaffolding, Violent Money. Uh, do we have any other sponsors? What, the Gym, Middlesbrough Fight Academy. Yeah, Middlesbrough Fight Academy. Yeah, Parver, BJJ. No plugs there just for anyone. Shout them all out, you know. The good people who support the good people. Love to see it. Uh, another random shout out. Leon Arms is a daft cunt. Fucking balding prick. <laughs> I Not tell you what, you sent me something fucking killed. You're making your own watermark so you make still your fucking memes. That killed me. So, for people who don't know, I went through a little phase before. I would make memes with the intention of letting people steal them. But the people who'd steal them wouldn't know that I've like hidden in, like the, the, the first one I did was, it was like Netflix Italy right now. And it's, you know, that I think it might be from Breaking Bad, the guy lying on that pile of money. Mm. And I just put very, you know, if you were looking at it and you, you could see it, but you wouldn't notice it otherwise, just Leon Arms is a nonce on the guy's shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and people stole that meme and shared it about that. <laughs> You get a sneaky Ainsley Harriet in there. Oh, yeah. There's many sneaky Ainsley Harriet in memes I've made. I mean, there's an art to it as well. And let's get this clear. So meme etiquette. So say you post a meme. I think it's saucy. I want to repost it. What is the etiquette? I'm, I'm saying a reaction and then just share it from there onwards. What's your sort of line you draw with stealing? I, re- I agree with that. I think if, if it's on someone's story, you react and then you share it. Mm-hmm. Um but then if it's a post, you probably should do a repost or at least stolen from and then put a thing. Yeah, we are. Bit of copywriting. Make sure they know where it's come from. Bit of respect. Again, people yeah. disrespectful these days need to know need to know the game, need to know the struggles. Meme etiquette. Well, this is where we get the real subjects on this podcast. It's not the stand, you know, how's training going, how's your what's your weight cut like? No, this is the proper things people want to know. Real fighter conversations. <laughs> Meme etiquette. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if it's a one exception I will make is if it's a um, if it's a private account on Insta that's mm. also a meme page. I just you just feel free to steal them. Mm. Like if you're a meme page and a private Insta, your stuff's fair game. You're kind of like a meme Robin Hood at that point. It's taken <laughs> from the private and give to the public. Yeah, I mean it certainly is not. Now. 
<laughs> Let, let's turn this back to May a little bit. So, regards to this side of things, obviously, you guys are, <laughs> as we sort of gather, you know, can have a laugh and have fun and stuff. But when it comes to switching things on, do you still like to have that sort of divide at some point? Do you have a switch, so to speak? So, like sparring, for example, do you like walking? Okay, now since we're in the gym, we're focused, we crack on, and afterwards, we, you know, let things go. What do you like to have that sort of balance as such? So, well, it's more the difference when there's a fight coming up. We have a certain session that's just the sparring. And just the length of the fight, it's just like three fives. And there's like a bit more intensity where we're not laughing and joking with our partners before we like get in the sparring. Just a few little differences, like like not having a sh- like topless sparring, just because it feels a bit different when the shots are hitting the body. You know, it's right. a bit more <laughs> like, the, the, you know, a bit more like the fight situation, but. Following from the dancing like conversation, this gives a different tone as well. You shout us with your boys, you know, have a little boogie, get ready for fight day. <laughs> Make sure you're yeah. in proper, like, in the flow of things. Sometimes do things like uh, just to prepare, be adaptable for weird situations, just jump into the spa without a proper warm up. Okay. So sometimes just, uh, like, I've sometimes done it before where I've, I've told someone, I'll go warm yourself up. Like, uh, you know, sometimes I coach and run some sessions. And I just leave them for fucking ages, just awkwardly like warming themselves, you know, because that's kind of like yeah. what a fight, you know, like just mm. they sort of start, they start pacing about, they start doing the stretches, they start shadow boxing, and you just watch them like go through all those motions. You kind of wait till they don't look ready, and then you just throw them in. I think there's a story about uh, a gymnast called, I think she's like Olga Golukov. No, Olga called. <laughs> Olga, <laughs> Olga Golukovic is from Metal Gear Solid 2. I think it's Olga Corbett. I think, but I might be butchering some words. So but apparently it. she uh, she would hit like perfect scores in her training every time, but she set a training and did routines and did practices exactly when she wanted. And then when she had a competition once, she fell apart and like got really bad scores. So to adjust it in training, she couldn't like call her own shots when she sparred and when... No, when she sparred. When she, when That's she what she's going wrong. When she was practicing. <laughs> <laughs> That's when she did her did, own sparring. When she did root, I'm still like confused myself from the Metal Gear Solid. <laughs> but when she did her own routines, like I think they changed it after that. So that it would be set at awkward times for her. So she would have to work to a different rhythm. Like sometimes they'd just miss a warm up and she'd have to go straight into it. I mean, this is the sort of the nature of the fight events themselves. Because again, when you're in the gym, you're there, say, at 8 o'clock, you're training this, that, and the other. You go home at the same sort of time. You've got your regimented time to an extent, obviously a bit of give and take. But as you say, in fight day, you just sort of get left to your own devices. That at some point, they might shout you. If they don't, oh, yeah, I've got an interval now. Your fight's getting pushed back a bit. <laughs> Imagine doing that in training. Like, okay, get warm. All right, come back in a couple of hours. You come back to the venue. <laughs> Try and weigh in. <laughs> that almost happened on, uh, when I fought in Dublin. Really? Because- I think my fight was one of the last prelims of the prelim card. And you know how they have the tight schedule where mm. if prelim, like prelims can't run over because it goes into the televised card. So if they don't fit it in, they put it as a postlim, which would mean waiting hours and hours and hours for the rest of the fights to happen and then fighting. And when I fought Richard Kiley, I just warmed up, feeling ready to go on all this. And then one of the runners comes in with an earpiece and he's like, uh, you're going to be a postlim now, so just cool off. You know, it'll be a few hours before you fight. And then as he's saying that, the fight that's going on, uh, was it Georgie Caranian? Yeah, it was Caranian versus you, when, Redmond. Yeah, it was Caranian mm. gets the guillotine and just shouts, for my son. <laughs> he gets that guillotine just then. And then the guy immediately gets in his earpiece. No, we're going now, but we have to run. So we run through this labyrinth in like the three arena. And then it, it's just like the most rushed thing ever. You know. to slap his Vaseline on there. <laughs> you got the cage side. Take your top off. As soon as he gets his top off, the guy just sort of like slaps some Vaseline <laughs> on each side. I mean, that is a fucking uns- uh, that's gives me fucking anxiety. That's horrible. So like <laughs> fuck that. So even then, like when it comes to your fight day sort of mindset when you're there about to go in, albeit, you know, <laughs> on this fucking moment's notice. Do you try and like get a certain like are you very game plan orientated? Is it a case you feel out when you get in there? Is it very much visual? Or is it just okay, just see how you get on and run with it? Uh it's just I have a few little buzzwords, more technical focus buzzwords. Like the last fight, I was just thinking um fence, double jab, breathe. Those are the three things I would just think. Like if I had 
sort of those weird it's awkward awkward alone times i'll just say faint double jab breathe faint double jab breathe and just think of the technically important points that i might be less liable to do like be more liable to forget about there is something that we do with each other that i only really noticed because i had there was an absence of you for my sort of warm-up for the last fight it's like we kind of understand how to trick each other a little bit and just like saying certain things just just to sort of keep them the sort of mind in, in like that that sweet spot of like aggressive but not too aggressive is it you know like it was sort of felt a bit weird without having that you know you normally just go sharp da, 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 this and like waiting a few seconds or waiting for the right time and then saying something else just to sort of stop that kind of like dead air happening in your head i don't know if it's but yeah i don't know if we've developed that consciously but it seems like something we just do yeah like spending the you know the, the time just before the fight or like even the walking through just i don't know it was a bit different because it was my first first fight without you cornering since fucking hell Brilliant amateur fight, wasn't it? Yeah, it'll have been an amateur fight last time when I fought without without George McConnor. But yeah, it was a bit strange. But yeah, you, you know. played quite a part in your um last fight then, Harry. I don't know. I don't know. I did fuck it a little bit, like uh, just slightly different decisions, and the fight would have been totally different. But uh, yeah, I think the main thing was the start of rounds one and two. I threw kicks that weren't quite whippy and non-committal, or blasting kicks that sort of throw them off but they were sort of in the middle and small and just reckon oh that that kick's not a huge threat and just charged in mm. and it's like you know all the good footwork and stuff that eventually came out in the third round doesn't really matter if someone just runs into you when you're still on one leg that's uh, i think that's where the main thing and then i was being a little bit too jujitsu yeah jump in the ghillie all the time yeah i, I mean I, I think it was because i came quite close at one point in the first round i thought ah close to that but I should have once, as soon as it failed, I should have been like, okay, now now this has got to be used to sweep. Now this has got to be used to this. Uh, but yeah, it was all right. It, you know, the stuff in the third round was good. I'll just, I'll milk that third round forever as far as like getting little clips and highlights, <laughs> for instance. Uh, Let's go to the well always. <laughs> oh, yeah. Don't stop milking while it's still milk. Yeah, it's all good. And that's the thing when it comes to someone like Richie as well. Did you get, not Starstruck's bit dramatic, but sense of, okay, the sort of level of opponent, that sort of name. Did you feel that no. played a part in the performance at all? No, not at all. Uh, no, nah. like there was just a few things. It's it's an, another thing where I've had I've got two decision losses on my record, where I fucking battered the guy. And I think it was it's just like a, I I only entered the cage just about under seventy kilos really, and that's for featherweight. That's tiny for featherweight. So now the main focus is just getting. A load of extra strength training in and just packing on a load of size um which you know it's going to be fucking difficult especially when you're not taking any of these special supplements that half these cunts do um or poor but... palmos <laughs> poor palmos are the better <laughs> poor palmos are like top of usada's list of <laughs> tested positive for palmo <laughs> Picos of Palmo. Palmo Picos, that's what we want. <laughs> he tested positive for Pork Palmo. How do you know? Well, the blood wasn't actually coming out of his ass. He's just, <laughs> just fat. His special muscles. <laughs> his arteries were just clogged. <laughs> trying to test the, the Picos of Palmos. The perfectly, the perfectly prepared Palmos in the Pico. I can't get my words out. Perfectly prepared picograms of Park End Pizzeria Parmesans. There we go. <laughs> what is this podcast? <laughs> what is this they, uh, yeah, they, they always go off the rails. It's, I don't know. That's, That's my favourite part, I think. Last time we did quite offensive, like, fighting accents. That was quite good. That's the point, George. How's your answer, Silva? Were they? Were they offensive? I don't know. I, don't know. I won't go back to them too much. Go on, George. Give us your best Anderson Silva. Yes, we need to drag out the ease. He's normal. <laughs> I don't know why I just said that. Anyway, <laughs> moving on swiftly. It's not <laughs> offensive, though. It's not offensive if you're doing an impression of someone. 
<laughs> that's not how it works. I'm sure if you no, it's, it's offensive you're... if, like, say, the, the person's I'm... from, like, I don't know, China, and you just go straight to the fucking most torrent. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Just go to the most, like, horrendous, generic, stereotypical accent. But if you're doing, like, a specific voice of someone, that can't be, that's not offensive. I'm sorry, Anderson. I know you listen quite regularly. I don't mean to bring this to you. It's all right. <laughs> I'm sorry, mister. <laughs> it's one of them ones as well. Like, do you guys watch a lot of fights outside of like, your own opponents and stuff? Are you quite up to date yeah. with the whole rosters and things like that? Are you on for watching tape? Or do you watch a lot of tape on your opponents? Uh, watch a bit. Try and watch more of like each other's opponents, if you know what I mean. There's like too much. You can do too much tape study, I think, where you kind of get this false impression of what the fight's going to be in your head because you saw like, oh, well, he does this and he does this and he does... Fights are weird and chaotic. It's never, it's never like how it is in your head. With, um, you made an interesting point earlier, Harry, about how where you used to see your opponent on a fight day or whatever else you get, that sort of, you know, standard butterflies or whatever, you'd be a bit sort of, okay, shit, I'm going to fight this man. I don't want to make a surprise, but yeah, you get that sort of, okay, it's unsettling, but as you've turned professional more experienced, it's not really a thing anymore. I don't know the things that you've really noticed that transition point from like amateur to professional, like that kind of stuff, like watching too much tape, things like that. Is there any other sort of, I don't know, key areas where you've really noticed that change? Uh, I just have to think. Um, uh, well, a big thing with a small training structure is making the training for a fight more about intensity than volume. Yeah. Which is like, we used, you know, used to think, Especially when you're getting in as like an amateur, you think, well, if, I, if the fight's three fives, if I spar six and seven fives, I'm going to be twice as fit. Whereas you need to train for the pace of the fight. That's a big thing. Yeah. So it's like if we have a sparring, like a hard sparring, it'll be three fives and that's it. That's the full session. Yeah, that's one of the big things that comes to mind. We actually do more rounds when we don't have fights coming up. Like more rounds of a lower intensity just making sure you're getting through lots of different situations. You're seeing more like what you, different bodies do, how people react, but just have a lower intensity where you're trying to like keep yourself fresh kind of, you, you don't want to injure yourself outside of fight, but then fight training, it's, it's more about intensity. So when you say intensity there, when it comes to those spars, is it essentially just a fight without getting paid for it? Or is it a sense of, okay, it's just hard sparring control to an extent. Yeah, it's to an extent where if we go like really hard, get the 16 ounces and this and that. And it's also just with people more like you trust. Yeah. Like the, it's one of them where it's like shots to the body and shots to the legs. It's like you got pads on, just go full out. But then just don't try and knock them up. Yeah, like if, if you get a shot really well lined up to the head. Like, if you know you're getting a free shot, just just not wellying that one in. Mm. Like, you're going to be throwing hard, and sometimes stuff lands quite hard. But, like, I don't know, say if you manage to get someone off balance and their their head's dipping one way and you throw a head kick, like, pull that. Mm. If you get me? Yeah, yeah. When it's on a plate, you know, don't fucking, like, smash it. But, again, like, your jab and stuff, don't feel the need to, like, tickle it. That kind of yeah. thing, sort of rule of thumb. yeah. The jabs actually, uh, just going back to like less intense sparring, the sparring that you just do all the time outside of fight camp, the jab is the punch that I think leads to the most sparring escalations I've seen. Like, it's people... It's, 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 it's like a like, statement. <laughs> it, it's, you know, but it's like, the amount of times I see you spar escalate because someone thinks someone else is going hard, but the, in reality, they've just like headbutted a jab that wasn't that hard at all. It's just, it's a very like stiff impact they like move into it and they're like boom he's hit me hard what a prick and then they start like the jab is the is the provocative the biggest spar escalate i've seen <laughs> it is one of those ones though because again you don't realize how hard you throw stuff even not even nervous energy but just general like they're coming onto it <laughs> leg kicks as well yeah it's one of those that probably started in the echo okay that's fine in the words of george it's time to dance you know let's have a boogie Strictly speaking. <laughs> yeah, like, like, because so, we've had, um, we, because of, you know, Ab Abdul's sort of quite famous, I guess. We get, we do get a fair few people who, like, English isn't their first language. 
and that's one point that's quite hard to explain across that like you know there was so we made some some people do a hard spar before and because one guy was kicking him really hard in the leg he just thought well that means everything must be hard and it, it's it's like hard to explain the difference between mm-hmm. like your legs they'll just get more they'll just get tougher as long as you're not letting your knee get buckled and your legs will just get tougher your body as long as now it's getting none of your ribs are getting broken it'll just get tougher your brain won't and your partner's brain won't um so yeah that's that's quite a hard one to explain even even people with english where it's their first language it's still hard to explain that look he's kicking you in the leg that's fine your your legs not your you can't get brain damage in your leg you can't get like permanent lasting damage really from a leg kick what do you think yeah (laughs) i mean mean, Unless your knee just gets fucking mad buckled in, or someone like does a calf kick and snaps your shin. But, calf kicks are such cans as well. But nerve sort of ending sort of thing. They, oh, I can't deal with them. Oh, I've had that. I've had that once, and it was awful. When I, I sparring. Saw, uh, sparring. I had it once, and I sort of like, like it was a spar George was watching as well. I'm, I sort of play it like I kind of. So pretended I, like I was just doing some weird movement, but I think it was kind of obvious. I just got hit and it's like, whoa! Like, you know, like the Anderson Silva, yeah. like the weird hand thing he starts doing. I like got hit and then moved back into the other stance and started doing all this stuff to try and just distract it. Yeah, that yeah. makes it way more obvious. Because <laughs> the thing is, it's no hiding that sort of thing as well. And like, it's the whole thing that if you get hit, you sort of smile it off, this, that, and everything. Everyone knows exactly what that means. Like, I don't know who. Yeah. I don't know why it's still instinctual to think, okay, I'm going to smile so people don't think it hurt a lot. <laughs> I think the the best thing, like, George started a bit, is where you just, oh, like, I did it against Rose. It's where you kind of, like, just, yeah. Like, if you're going to do any kind of mugging, not, oh, you just hit me, I'm going to smile, just, yeah. Like, that's, that's the best way, just, so, like, I don't know. I mean, this is another thing in itself. So, regards of planning and prep and things like this obviously you're saying about watching tape kind of let each other do that as such do you try and imitate each one of the other's like opponents as such do you try and like does george like affect a sort of you know irish accent for the camp <laughs> and you, you start flipping <laughs> pieces <laughs> that was one of the awkward ones for uh, this last fight because we were both fighting on the same day is that normally we do because it'll be one sort of out of camp a bit and the other one's training for a specific fight. And we can kind of mimic each other's opponents. <clears throat> this one, we kind of just had to focus on our own game plans, even when we were sparring with each other. And yeah. it just, it adjusted a bit. So, like, I'd, when I'd spar with Harry, I'd try and take him down a bit more. But I wouldn't go full into an impression mode. Yeah, I, I was trying to do more of this solely impression when I... Because we sort of do each other's pad work um, when I was doing the pads for George. Like, just because... I knew I'd be warming George up as well, so I was like, "All right, I can, you know, the, this stuff's going to be the stuff that just carries through." So it was like, "Well, all right, if ever, if I, even when I'm holding pads, if ever George was circling that way, I'm going to kick his leg. If ever he's circling this way, I'm going to throw this high kick. It, after he throws punches, I'm just going to start like I'll get him to throw a combination, then I just start even with the big pads on, start like looping punches over for him to move out the way of um, that kind of thing. But luckily, <clears throat> we have we had two guys in the gym. One guy in particular who were really good sparring partners for Solly. Um, even, they even looked Italian. Yeah, they even look Italian. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> they were That's mentally all prepared. They look. <laughs> one of them has, I think you might think, might be one of the, the best nicknames ever for a gym, uh-huh. uh, an MMA guy. Um, Ed Miliband. His, his, his dad... I've Jordan. seen him. I've seen him because you tag him in a lot of stuff. I think that can't be the same one, surely not. <laughs> I, just, I, I just tagged the because he doesn't have an Instagram. I just tagged the actual. Yeah, that's what, makes, that's what gets me. <laughs> yeah, he's the thing is he's he's called Adil Yunus. I think he's like jo, he's Jordanian, but um, we didn't know his name for like a year, a year really? and a half. Yeah, it was just someone called him Ed Miliband once when he was new, and that's it just it stuck. That's all it needs. That's just <laughs> once. Oh, that's that's Ed, that's Ed Miliband, and he responds to it now. Like <laughs> he even so said, uh, outside outside of the gym, he heard, he was just wandering around his, around his uni, and someone shouted Ed, and he looked and went, oh no, 
they head out from the gym like it was someone shouting someone else. <laughs> it's dreadful. So that's another point. Favorite nicknames in the fight world. Go on. First one that springs to mind outside outside of Ed Miller Band. Um, I, mean, we, I, I, I like the I like kind of some of the Thai nicknames where it gets translated and it's just something very literal, like Diesel Knife. I don't know what the tie is for it, but it translates to the sky piercing knee kicker. Yeah, that's cool. Good. That is that's so it. cool. The direct yeah. translation is just cooler than anything we could call for. Or just El Flaco. It's a Mexican guy. What is no, he it's Nicaraguan. Nicaraguan. Uh, Alex Aguero. El Flaco Explosivo. Just <laughs> the explosive thin man. <laughs> like, I mean, at me next time. It's one of those ones. I mean, I was yeah. thinking more Love Dr. Proctor, but like, you know, <laughs> I'm getting a completely different world. The leagues of this. Oh, I mean, I mean, we wouldn't have time to explain them. Um, Go on, we've got more but, time, get comfy. But just some of the ones from the gym, like Woo Woo Man or Battle Onion, like these are the ones we we'll, I I'll never be able to explain these on air to, to the public. Um, you would only ever get those explained in private. <laughs> so, so yeah, Suck Dick, Woo Woo Man, Jacrispy, Crispy, Battle Onion. Um, are these going to be announced when they walk out? Are these like the actual fight names? <laughs> these are these are names of people, like nicknames we give people in the gym. Are you, uh, are you guys bullies in the gym out of interest? It's one of those ones. That's it, right. <laughs> so they know they've got these nicknames. The, the banter in an MMA gym has to be really fucking harsh. Because if you can't survive banter, you can't survive a fight. <laughs> I think they're very different things. <laughs> getting called a cut and called call this out and the other versus, you know, getting beaten up are two different things. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, Battle Onion only came once and that he ended up with that nickname. <laughs> That's what it takes. <laughs> That's one of my favourites, I think. I'm not too sure. Oh, God, I've got absolutely no idea where to go with this. And on that note, um, <laughs> where can people find you on the other social media, guys? Instagram at G underscore Hwick. Instagram at Harry I Hardwick. Cool. That'll all be in the description.